are listening to an American Free Press podcast. Joining me on the line for the day three update for Bilderberg 2013 is Mark Anderson. Mark, you out there? I sure am in a rather quiet place in Britain, kind of a lodge for a campground. It's quiet, so we've got some good quality time here and apparently a good connection as the Bilderberg Group just concluded their 2013 meeting and they filed out of the Grove Hotel, oh, about maybe five hours ago. Okay, great. And so right now on the East Coast here, it's 20 after 4, so I guess it's 20 after 9 there. So they left around this time, our time, actually, left about 4 o'clock in the afternoon then, right? At the latest, yeah. That was probably the last of them, or maybe a little bit before that, right, right okay. around there. It's been an interesting last couple of days. Yeah, I want to get into that, but this time that they're checking out, that would be the late checkout for Bilderberg type. So you and I, we have to check out 10, 11 o'clock, latest 12, maybe if we're lucky one, but Bilderberg gets till 4 or 5 in the afternoon. Well, yeah, depending on who it is and depending on security this was a very complex affair of the four years i've covered it now i have never seen such security measures and such extensive preparations and operations my goodness now last time we spoke we did a day two update day three of course was yesterday that was june 8th and it also corresponded with the anniversary of the attack on the uss liberty oh yes coincidentally We know what happened on day two. Now, day three, of course, I already spoke with Pete and Jim, and they filled me in on a bunch of stuff. But I want to get your take on it here. Now, what they said was that this was turned into some kind of a Woodstock-type festival. To an extent, they called it the Bilderberg Fringe Festival as it was billed. And it really didn't take shape to fit that name until day three yesterday when the people with a little more sizzle to their name in some ways, David Icke and Alex Jones showed up. And especially for David Icke, he has kind of a cult following, if those those words might fit. So as of yesterday, people were filing in. And while they had maybe 250 people day one, maybe three or 400 on day two, they had an estimated approximately 1,500 yesterday on day three, primarily to see David Icke and somewhat to see Alex Jones. However, there were numerous and constant inquiries at our media tent about Jim Tucker and or myself and AFP in general, and a lot of curiosities. I must have shot, all told up to this point, probably 18 different video and audio interviews, radio interviews, a Finnish public television station. Their crew shot some footage of me speaking about Bilderberg. We're talking Finland. We're talking Sweden. We're talking Switzerland. We're talking British outlets, the Rick Santelli show across the spectrum, really. And people were very interested in what I had to say and what I had to say with regards to Jim's passing and what Jim used to do. And I also added what Jim Trafficant's been talking about with the FOIA, Freedom of Information Inquiry, into Bilderberg to amplify that, to make sure that's getting out there. So while we had these big names, I was constantly barraged with interview requests. And that speaks well for AFP and some journalists associates that were helping me out here. And so it went very well. And yeah, it was a Woodstocky kind of thing. The upside, Dave, is that it raised a lot of awareness in general about Bilderberg and gave it more sizzle. Maybe people that only knew a little or didn't know much were drawn to know more about Bilderberg. On the other hand, there are some that have shared concerns with me, oftentimes without me looking for those concerns. I'm not always fishing for it. But oftentimes, especially today, people came up to me and said, well, all this festivities, and calls for transparency is all good and well, but a lot of people feel a little uneasy that some of the transparency that some are calling for could end up being sort of counterfeit in a way. They want more than transparency. They want the Bilderberg Group to not be something that continues much longer. And Jim Traffic, and to his credit, even though he hasn't followed Bilderberg real long, does have something there with his practical approach. And I talked about that some, and that perked some people's ears, plus some of my own points. Yeah, they want transparency but they want it to be for real. You're saying there were about 1,500 people there yesterday. Those guys had a different count. They thought there were a lot more than that. I think they said something like maybe 3,500. I don't mean to be contradictory, but the police told me explicitly they would have never allowed that many in one day at one time. I'd say 3,500 is probably the grand total for all three days. And maybe that's where the discrepancy is. Well, they talked about Jones and Ike and pretty much people came there to see them, not so much coming there to learn the truth about Bilderberg, because if they did want to know the truth about Bilderberg, all they'd have to do is read American Free Press. Did Jim or Pete have any opportunity opportunity to get up as a speaker? Because I know they told me that there were even people doing rap up there and there would be plenty of opportunity for them to actually speak. But did they have any opportunity, you think, to get up there as a speaker? 
Not really. The way the operation was run, we were somewhat excluded by the organizers. Some of it was the madness to rush to the stage by miscellaneous performers. Some of it was the sort of elbowing their way in by the top speakers. There is, I don't mind saying, something of a rift between the organizers and AFP, somewhat to do over issues, over Zionism and whatnot. It's not an antagonistic thing to the extreme, but there is something of a rift there. And I gave them a speaker's list and they really didn't honor it. Okay, so they had no interest in having a, like I said to those guys, I don't think there were too many 17-year term congressmen in the audience there. Do you think that they overrode the interest that the people might have had in someone of his stature speaking because they wanted to defend an alternative agenda? Maybe it's a little too early to tell on the alternative agenda, but everyone was just so keyed up for the headliners. They just kind of elbowed their way in. And those that organized the stage, which included the Guardian writer, Charlie Skeleton, really gave us the cold shoulder to a point. And there really wasn't anything we could do about that. However, Jim did address his point several times Saturday to gatherings that were probably, you know, 15, 20, 25 people at a pop. And a lot of people would gather around and listen as he told his point. And so he did generate some interest. Of course, he'll be writing about it in AFP and I'll be referring to it and touching on it. And then people can read his column for more details. I've got pictures of him there. It's one of those things. Every Bilderberg meeting is different. I had a lot of things I was doing there and Jim wasn't always there the whole day. The security getting in required waiting in a line that was sometimes a hundred people long. And it was difficult to get everyone there at the same time. There was a lot of logistics problems and they wouldn't really give you any special treatment if you'd come in at the order that you lined up. And so we were battling against a number of forces up to and including the long lines, time limitations, and just you name it. Nevertheless, though, I think that considering what we were up against, all told that we left a good mark there. There was so much interest in what AFP was doing there, stemming from Jim Tucker primarily, but also people wondering what's going on now that he's passed or wanting to know more about what happened. So the media exposure, as I say, I did probably 20 interviews and Jim and Pete did their share of talking to people and whatnot. It was a toughie. There's also photographers that were working kind of under my subtle direction and we were posting people at all sorts of places. So it's a big undertaking to try and get the photos, the attendance confirmation, to do the reports while you're there, to gather the information that you're going to report later. And it's amazingly challenging, especially this year with the largest audience in terms of sheer quantity that they've ever had at a Bilderberg meeting, although there are a number of issues to sort out. Right. Now, the audience size. Did you get a sense of how educated the audience was or were they there basically just to party and smoke pot? And did you smell the pot? Yeah, you could smell some. It wasn't overwhelming and I wasn't surprised. I would say that for the David Icke and Alex Jones thing, the average age was probably 25, give or take a little. It was a lot of younger people, people doing drum circles, people doing kind of performance art. It definitely was, you know, more of a, if I can use the term, leftist crowd. That doesn't make it a bad thing. I would say that their knowledge of Bilderberg is probably minor to medium with a few having more knowledge about it. I think they were there partially for getting more information, but partially just for the association, the revelry, the sense of common purpose, the sense of common interest, as a lot of them told me. But as I say, several approached me on their own volition and said, sometimes we feel like this is too much about personalities and not enough about what's going on inside the Grove Hotel by the Bilderbergers themselves. All right. Well, that's a good thing. What you said, before was clearly that American free press was snubbed, right? That would be the right word, right? Well, cold shouldered a bit when it came to being on stage. I've known about certain differences in opinion, let's just be gingerly about it, with some of the other media there ever since 2010. AFP is generally treated well by the readers and activists and whatnot, but some other media, whether they're alternative or mainstream, if they know something about our overall editorial policy, you know, they do have some reservations about us and sometimes keep us at arm's length. I don't emphasize it or even worry about it because I've got so much work to do and I just do my work. But nevertheless, we held our own 
And while the big names with their names and lights, so to speak, were up there pontificating, although they made some good points, we were on radio shows and being interviewed live stream or pre-recorded stuff almost constantly. I mean, practically nonstop. I almost lost my voice. It's even a little hoarse right now. Yeah, I was going to say, you sound like you're coming down with something. And you think that's primarily due to Tucker? You mean the interest in AFP? Yes. Yeah, I think that's the one common thing. A lot of people were curious about what I'm doing now that he's not there, or they didn't know who I was. And they're like, oh, you're the one that's following in his footsteps. Oh, that's cool. Because a few people wondered whether we would keep going now that Tucker had passed. Right. I remember you told me about that before. Who do you think is primarily responsible for snubbing AFP? Charlie Skelton. So this is the fellow who writes for The Guardian and who organized this Bilderberg Fringe Festival. Yes. Okay, why do you think that it's, you know, you answered very quickly. Why do you think he's the man? Well, I mean, he made it fairly clear. He expressed reservations about AFP when I first met him in Spain in 2010. And it has to do with Zionist issues and related matters. Some of the alternative media don't like to be associated with those things. So they want to kind of carve out their own niche and not always include everyone. But you got to remember that the alternative media is not monolithic. There's common goals and common interests, but there's also differences of opinion. We're not like the mainstream where any differences are almost non-existent and they all follow more or less the same agenda. Right. So, right. You, you know, there's competition, there's rivalry. It's not all one voice saying Bilderberg's bad. There are rivalries there, no doubt about it. But you do think that American Free Press did get some notice? Oh, absolutely. The flow was almost constant to our tent and the requests for interviews were almost Almost nonstop across many kinds of media in many different countries. Did you have like an AFP sign up at the tent? At times, I was wearing my press pass, which made it very clear. It's a very large press pass. And I would stand out there and I had a few papers to hand out due to luggage limitations. I didn't always have a whole bunch of papers with me. But I mean, all told, it was a nonstop either working to gather news to report later or being asked to do stuff right then, live stream, radio, as well as having talked to you earlier in other podcasts. It's a logistical undertaking, especially this year, of rather epic proportions. Are you flying out today or tomorrow? Actually, the next day, Tuesday. Mark, thanks again for your time, and we'll talk to you real soon. Okay. Good night. Good night.